I can't tell. Is that in focus? It looks like I need to bring it just a touch back. Welcome to the stream, boys. We're going to do a live mids watch. If you're catching this live, welcome to the ultra professional manual focus. If you're not catching this live, you're probably catching it a day or two after I finished it, or uh, I think it was better where it was before. Let's just... There we go. Love the Macos camera. The only thing I don't love about it, it's manual focus and a little bit squirrely. Uh, I'm going to do some mids watch recordings for you guys today. If you're new to this, I do mids watches, usually like Tuesdays, Thursdays. I release them at midnight. They're like lo-fi, um, relaxing, red-pilled field report and some breakdowns, red-pilled concepts. Good stuff to know. Mostly the stuff coming out of the Jack Ten of Hearts can work. Yeah, it's live, thoughtfully. I'll, I'll be ignoring you while I record the episodes, but in between we'll shoot the shit here. And I've decided to go with a nice, chill, you know, like a vaporwave sunset, you know? So it's going to be, if I'm lucky in my voice holds, I can get through five episodes here. So the first one, the wife doesn't deserve an unplugged man. It's going to be a fun little one there. It's mostly about parenting. Uh, why didn't you say anything? Understanding your wife's frame. That one's actually going to be so there was the occasional girl that would come in. So and it's kind of like getting inordinate amounts of attention. We don't do those anymore. It's like no chicks allowed. But I mean, it's good for good for posterity. Um, pushing for sex with a sick wife. Sick wife. I have a feeling that one is going to be a little bit uh, a little bit spicy. But I think you'll like where it's going. And then the other one where she hates your dad. Uh, why didn't I see this one before? Are you recycling footage? Dude, Santiago, are you fucking with me? Jesus Christ. Hey, what's going on? Anywho. So it'll be good. I'll try to give you guys some good concepts. It's actually funny because there's this guy. This is me, triple zero seven, which uh, he's been in a, a mids watch previously, and he's got two on this one. So he's actually going to be kind of an interesting case. I'm going to do my best to, if I can put in some like pithy quote things to make some fucking TikToks out of it. So whatever. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to get started now. I'll see you guys in a couple minutes. <laughs> I know the shtick. Here for my wife lessons. Oh, you'll like episode. You'll like part three then. It'll be good. It's like sometimes your wife just doesn't deserve the new you. Welcome, Mids Watch. Ryan, if you guys are watching this when it first comes out, it should be midnight on a Tuesday or a Thursday. Uh, if you're new to the channel, like, subscribe, you know, that stuff. And the point of these things is something you could just leave off in the background while you're getting some study done. Maybe you can't sleep. You're going to get some red pill lessons. There's no red meat. There's no bravado. There's no yelling and screaming at women. It's just straight up red pilled field reports and breakdowns. Every red pilled mental model you didn't know and were afraid to ask. If you're new to like dating and sex and relationships in general, this stuff may all sound new to you. But if you've been around the block a while, you've got a couple notches under your belt. Maybe you even have a girl at home that can stand the sight of you or can't stand the sight of you. Most of this stuff should resonate with you. And this is where I prefer talking about red pill practically. None of this stuff should be brand new. Anyways, this one is from a guy. We've done a field report of his before. I don't know if I've mentioned it specifically, but he's, this is me, 0007. He's going to have a few of these in the next coming weeks. So it's kind of neat. He talks about a break in his frame leading to bad stuff, man. So the last weekend, he goes on a five-hour drive, overnight trip with the kids to a park. Gets back at Sunday, you know, driving for five hours straight. He goes straight to bed. The trip was great, yada, yada, yada. And no hassle, because as he said, he held frame. Now, if you've listened to my channels before, you know when guys talking about holding frame or losing frame, you understand the concept there. It's that guys don't have a strong, coherent worldview how they approach life, and they don't have the confidence to enforce it. So that's where he's at right now. Just remember, these sports are never, they're never vets. These are guys in the middle of things. So in the morning, kitchen, she has some, you know, inconsequential stuff, just some shit testing. And instead of the standard stuff, he starts getting snippy with his responses. Nothing like swearing or yelling or nasty, but definitely not the frame that he's going for. So he gets back into frame, but it's too late. Then she's been in a major bitchy rut all week. He mostly ignores it with a little bit of a green amplify, and this morning, it finally seems like the ship is righted. Then my son accidentally smacks her in the eye at 7 in the morning, causing her to be in a bit of pain. That was right when we were going to work, 
So she asks for an ice pack and for him to take the kid on an errand. So we go, and at the end, she asks me to do something for him. I tell him I will later today. He starts to throw shit. I tell him as a consequence, it's going to wait until Sunday now. He throws more shit, and now I tell him it's Monday. He does some more shit as we walk into the door at home. I tell him Tuesday, and if he does anything else related to this, I'm going to add a week to it on that. He goes crying to mom, and she asks what's up, but before I inform her, she says, you two can have each other. I tell her that is how I want to, this not how I want to be spoken to that I will not be talking about the subject right now the son pushes him so he adds a week onto the consequence the wife says ignore everything your father says he's being a bad parent in front of my son and my daughter pause there so parents in the chat right now probably have a what in the hell yeah tells the kids your dad is a bad father right in front of both of them if you guys don't know, there's like not many hardcore boundaries. That's one of them. So I tell her, don't you dare speak to me like that. I will not put up with it and there will be a consequence for her. She then loses it and I ignore. A few minutes later, she asks to talk. She says something but doesn't address her comments. I tell her there is one path she can follow if she wants to deal with me anymore. And that's explain in front of the kids that she should not have said that. And that she agrees with the consequences I put in place for our son. I tell her, until this happens, we're done. So I'm not sure if I broke frame again when telling her that there would be a consequence for her too. It came out mostly because I had been reading about the most responsible teenager in the house. Anyway, it's time to get some more stuff in the house done. Uh, the most responsible teenager in the room is an old red-pilled post from probably 2012. It essentially uses a concept called Brifolt's Law. To, to make the case that women mature quicker, quickly, quicker than men, but they peak their maturity around the, the age that, you know, Paleolithic people would start having cave babies. Now, I don't know if it's true or not. It doesn't really matter. But the point is, you stop looking at your woman as an equal. Like, oh, she's just like a man. She thinks the way I think. It's an extension of me. It's, like, it's, it's what people are the same. And then you start realizing you're dealing with an emotional adult right here. Like they call it the the most responsible teenager in the house. Now, it pisses off a lot of girls to hear that because they think you're calling them a big child. And it's like, no, most responsible teenager in the house. Um, there's actually a lot with this one. I almost want to, okay, we're going to start with the, the Jack thing here. But beforehand, I like some of the old guys. So I've talked about CP before. He was the guy whose um, wife had three kids becoming extremely ornery the entirety of like three or four different subreddits was just harassing him constantly about how he applied dread with his wife but he put through all of that he's probably got one of the strongest frames i've ever seen at least the strongest one that's been tested and he's like look red pill or not you don't undo the other parent's decision it's like close quarters battle you have to follow the lead man you are teaching your kids to sow discontent and go whine to the other parent now, if there's disagreement, you two can discuss it, and then the parent that made a bad decision will go back to the kids and tell him he changed his mind, but that should be rare. You will be much better served by having kids that know they can't whine and change decisions, even if it means you stick to a few bad decisions there. And then the professor, Blue Pill Professor, he's the guy who wrote our book on Dread. He's like, yeah, what you did there was technically a nuke. And it's appropriate when you're in a strong position, wit's end, but... At this point, they kind of dance around the issue, and I'm kind of with Jack on this one, where he cuts to the core of it. And he's like, I'm really glad I read this stuff before my own comment to him. If you know what he's talking about here, I'll pull it up. So his previous comment, there we go was dude that's a lot of hamstering a ton of it this is wine more please chiming in by the way it really hurts to read that i wanted to apologize a meeting uh, immediately but you know excuse number one the kids feel bad for me emotional manipulation i want to be on a team but on my terms only you know long-term impacts on my health physically and emotionally but the children's would realize is very serious this is stuff that's been edited out for a lot of it too you realize it's missing from there but he has a lot of extra comments to go on just realize he's basically deering, defending, excusing, explaining, and rationalizing his work. So like, look, one more please looks at him. He's like, I'd start with this. Long-term impacts on the children start when you decide to call me a bad parent directly in front of them. You knew you were in the wrong, 
and you should have apologized right away, but decided to let your pride take precedence over being a responsible and cooperative couple. Whatever you want, and however you feel. Deciding that you want to mitigate your responsibility while pushing all the blame is absurd to me. Take responsibility for your part, and then we can have an adult conversation. He's like, I would absolutely not back down, like everybody else is saying here. I would also say something about realizing that you have a spine if you wanted to throw in a low blow. Don't succumb to random emotional manipulation. Realize, at the end of this, you'll be end up in a better situation than her, irrespective of the situation. Hope that you got an emergency fund and a lawyer consult signed up because you don't want to get into a gunfight with empty words. And oh yeah, if she has to go to the kids for validating her adult decisions, she's doing something very, very, very wrong. Pandering to kids just seems lazy to me. So, back to this one. And I, I should say too, there's a, for a lot of guys, when they want to start getting to these or else kind of arguments... The difference between an ultimatum and a boundary enforcement is if you have any reason to enforce it. In this case, he's just talking. There's nothing he can actually do to enforce these things with his wife. And I hate to say it, but for most guys, you need to get, sometimes you need to be ready to initiate a divorce. Talk to a lawyer, explain your situation, talk about your ideal end state. He lets you know the things you can do, what it's going to cost. You got to find out if you can live with that or not. And if you can't, then you have a mitigating strategy to do what you need to do to get to a point where if you had to divorce, you will come out the other end just fine. Now, I'm not going to say what the actions are. It all depends what your goals are. Depends what the lawyer suggests, your jurisdiction. There's too many variables. So you have to do it on your own. And it's, it's dressed in coveralls and it looks like work. But when you've done that, and I've talked before, you know, sometimes it's just treat your wife like she was dead. Operation Scorched Earth. Pare down your life to the point where you can manage your entire life and the people within it by yourself. That way, you gain that confidence. Through that work, you gain your frame. And through that frame, you gain the confidence to have these fights. And these big fights become boundary enforcements instead of ultimatums. And that's ultimately what Winemore Please is telling him to do here. Now, Jack Tenhearts, our resident uh, prolific speaker, he's like, I'm glad I read that first before I put my comment in. I had like a thousand words written about how your wife was looking for an oak and fogging. And how it looks like he got the wrong idea from the oldest teenager in the house, blah, blah, blah. Now, for what it's worth, I did see a lot of parallels in an older field report that had the same thing, and it seemed similar. But this woman doesn't deserve an oak. I thought Op's wife had been a bitch because she liked, because of things like medical problems. I didn't realize she had an 800-pound hamster on top of that. She takes zero responsibility for calling you a bad parent in front of your own son. Her day got derailed by being poked in the eye and she decided that meant she got to act all shitty about it and blame you for everything. Are there really hamsters big enough to think this way? If I feel any discomfort, I get to act shitty to my family? If my husband loses his cool in response, I get to act like that's why I was acting shitty and blame him? If he keeps his cool, then I get to act like he doesn't want to be part of the team and that's why I acted shitty? And even if he completely coddles me, I get to act like the initial discomfort was his fault anyway. You know, I can't even... Like, fuck... That's how bad this is. It's so bad that I can't even. I can't even. Can't even. It goes to quote him here. Like, whatever you want, and however you feel, deciding that you want to mitigate your responsibility while pushing all the blame is absurd to me. Take responsibility for your part, and maybe we can have an adult conversation. He goes, yeah. At this point, all the fogging in the world is irrelevant anyway. You did deploy a nuke way too early. But backing down now is just going to encourage more triple A, grade A emotional manipulation that your wife is using to make you feel bad and take the blame for basically everything. Now, I didn't realize that his wife could be this unpleasant and even worse, this emotionally manipulative. Worse yet, this is clearly doing enormous damage to how your kids are being raised. The son is told his father is a shitty parent. The daughter is being used to justify mom's shitty behavior. A divorce would literally be more charitable than their upbringing than existing in this marriage at this state. So my thoughts on this one. He is, they are absolutely right. And I think that especially single guys run into a problem where they think these strategies, these magical red pill mental models, these tips and tricks is that there's a toolbox to solve every problem. And I don't make it any better by providing all the times when the tools actually do work little bit of cheerleading you never show the losses you only show the wins but in some cases these tools allow you to make yourself and to be a better man 
to build yourself with more abundance, to have better options, to be stronger with your boundaries, to have shed your nice guy behaviors. But at the end of it, it doesn't necessarily mean you get your wife back. In fact, it doesn't even necessarily mean you're going to want to get your wife back. There is some cases where chicks are, for lack of a better word, a stunned cunt, an emotional cripple, a mental midget, whatever terms of service violating euphemism from the 80s you want to throw in here, you can throw it in here. In this case, that's the wife. Now, as far as solutions go, everybody's right. Nuking it is strong, a hard boundary. The problem with Op here is that he doesn't have a follow through. He can say there will be consequences, but what are they? He hasn't prepared for a divorce. He hasn't prepared for the child rearing. He has nothing he can basically use to enforce his will here. And it's not even like it's an unreasonable will. And even if it was, it's his to enforce. So just remember, when you're seeing these red pill mental models, when you're seeing me talk strategy, that there's always the chance that maybe, just maybe, when you get your shit together, your wife is still a cunt and you just have no time for her. I guess I should add too at the end of this. So you've heard, uh, I've had it on a very, very early mids watch about the three dysfunctional captains and the dysfunctional relationships within the married red pill. It turns out most guys will fall into one of three categories when they're failing in their marriage. The first is the drunken captain with a begrudging first officer. And that's the one where guys have let themselves slack. The girl feels like he's more of a dependent as opposed to a husband. Attraction gets lost. That's an easy one. That's most people. This is actually a type two, which is much rarer. It's the constantly complaining pastor. In this case, the wife isn't emotionally, intellectually, or, you know, she's lacking the maturity to be able to handle these things. And unfortunately, most people let their egos get ahead of them. So everything has to be somebody else's fault. It's expression of her emotions at the expense of everything. If you've ever heard, there's a thing called the narcissist prayer. And I, you know, I should pull it up to make sure I get it right. But it's something to the effect of, uh, I didn't do it. And if I did, I didn't mean to. And if I did, it wasn't that bad. And if I, and if it was, then it wasn't my fault. And if it was, well, you deserved it anyway. That's essentially what he's dealing with, which is weird because narcissism is generally speaking a masculine quality. It's the masculine disorder. But in the same way that men are being raised as defective women, women are being raised as defective men. In this case, he's got a defective man in his head. Now you can do a lot of work because it's the mother of your kids start establishing strong boundaries, essentially treating her as like the most responsible teenager in the house, almost like one of the dependents, one of the children. And that might work. I've seen other marriages where that goes well because the girl likes to be, you know, with her thumb held or the thumb held down on her, like a controlling thing. It's a little dysfunctional. It's not my taste, but I've seen guys do it. In fact, I've seen them go an extreme, <laughs> basically demoting their wife to plate and they seem to love it. So it's up to you. Just remember in these situations, there's no right answers, but there's no wrong answers either. So on that note, I'm going to leave you to it, and I'll catch you guys on the next episode. Have fun. Cheers. Ah, doo -doo -doo. Remux that mother... Okay. Dude, I forgot how... F this is me, 007. I forgot about him. It had been so long. A lot of these ones. I guess once again, seven years ago, but like... Uh, da -da -da. Serve me to-do list it's funny i wish i could i wish it was more applicable to the single guys because i've seen a lot of single guys do that they've been they'll do this shit but they've been dating a girl for like a month and then all of a sudden they start using a green amplify and fogging and all and you're like what the fuck are you doing it's like a it's a plate plate doesn't get the shit a lot of guys keep forgetting too that you know you're the prize treat yourself as valuable and they're like all right sounds good and then they, they use these trip and tricks to emotionally manipulate their wife into being a normal human being. And it's like, it's not how it works, man. It's not how it works. Anyways, how you guys doing in the chat? I almost forgot. Oh, dude. I'm gonna try something here. Apparently, I can insert the ads myself. I see. Suddenly fell down some stairs. Do you just withdraw attention or provide guidance? Well, that's the thing. There's actually, fuck, I should talk about the post. There is a red pilled post that I'll probably do a video on at some point in the future. It's that how do you lead uh, with a first officer that doesn't want to be led? It's probably good and applicable here, but at this point you can't.
honestly, this is why I talk about things like Operation Scorched Earth. If she's not on your team and she's like actively being insolent like this, do you guys remember my power talk? Put it on a spectrum. There's like for you and against you, higher status and lower status. In this case, the wife sees herself as lower status and not on his team. That's why insolence is the response back. At that point, the natural thing that you're going to do if you just let your emotions fly is to act higher status and against her. And then that becomes a whole negative thing and it just ends off just to be honest it's kind of like cut ties build your life as if she didn't if she wasn't there and do your best to make sure she's not if she gets lucky and if by me lucky i mean she has an ounce of sense she starts to show some investment starts to act right makes mistakes and then you can guide but until then like you can't expect it you shouldn't expect it because as soon as you have that expectation this whole thing becomes a covert contract and it doesn't work for anybody Oh, this guy. Or no, this one's the chick. Oh, yeah. Okay, next one I'm doing the chick. A not-so-typical situation. All right, let's do it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I think this one's the whammon. What's up, guys? Midswatch, Ryan, you're catching this one. It's probably about midnight if you're catching it when it first comes out. Otherwise, at whatever time of day, hope you're enjoying whatever work or study or goofing around or toilet time you're on right now. This is a rare one. If you don't know, these are mostly from the married uh, red pilled subreddit. A lot of married guys. It's not the Reddit you know of now. It was back when Reddit used to be fun and useful and very good. We had a rule back then where, yeah, you know, girls come in. That's fine. Just don't start tone policing. We eventually had to like do the full ban because it's like it just doesn't work. They just can't help but become women as soon as you start talking about some real shit that makes girls feel bad. But this would have been an early one by Aaliyah Catherine. She would have been probably the second or third, yeah, maybe the third field report I had ever seen from a girl. The first one was an old red-pilled coffee video, I believe, called uh, Vampire Squidina, where she blames the subreddit on her husband getting a spine. Um, another one was somebody you may recognize from Twitter, Dead's and Sushi. But yeah, this one. So I'll just get started. So I know this sub is frequented by men primarily, and I have posted in the Red Pill Women. Fortunately, very few of them can relate to my situation exactly, although I have received some helpful advice. I actually relate more to what a lot of the men here are going through, although I am a chick. You know, lack of sex, underappreciated bedwinder, or breadwinner, a <laughs> bedwinder. My significant other and I have two kids. I'm the breadwinner and always have massively out-earned them. I make about 200,000 a year, and he was making about 30k after he took a cut in pay from 45 that occurred while I was pregnant with our second child. And we made the decision that since we needed my income, that he should stay home since he always wanted to be a stay-at-home dad. It did not work out well. The house was a perpetual mess. He rarely cooked. I work 55 to 60 hours a week in a demanding field and feel both resentment and sadness about it. And frankly, I don't have the energy to do much else when I get home other than help with the kids. We talked and we decided he should go back to school, and I pushed this. I didn't know how else to curate respect for him anymore. He's now in community college for computer science, doing well, but only has one class during the summer. His mom comes over for six hours every day to help with the kids. Further, I have always had the higher sex drive. I need like five to nine times a week. He prefers weekly, if that, and I usually have to initiate it. It's obviously declined a lot over the years, but it's been a point of contention for us because I am really dissatisfied. I'm the same weight as when we mess. I've dressed feminine. I wear makeup. I have tried backing off and not saying anything and trying to be coy and flirtatious rather than overtly slutty with him, which is frankly hard for me when I just want to whisper really dirty things into his ear. So nothing makes a difference. He says he just doesn't feel like it. And the sex isn't obsessed. He's not obsessed with the sex like I am. I am miserable all the time as the result. I feel like I am entirely the man in this relationship, but I have to take on everything, which makes me even more resentful. Since I am being the chick, I want to ask, how do I approach this, and do I sound unreasonable? Are we simply doomed to the role reversal? Do any of you have wives that out-earn you or work more? I'm sorry if this is an intrusion. And she kind of adds later on after this is all said and done, thank you so much for your replies and insight. I was reading The Twelve Levels of Dread, and it might work. Like many of you gentlemen, I make unacceptable behavior really unacceptable, and it is very apparent I have the ability to move on and increase my own market value, or would this only further estrange and emasculate him? Hum. Now, this is the part we're going to address on here. This is why 
men and women are different. And I like it because Jack kind of flips the idea of dread on its head and shows a really good difference between them. Uh, before I start on that, there's actually a video on my channel. It's an old red pilled coffee where George Bruno, if you guys don't know, the barber sultan himself, the guy who <laughs> there's murderers in that building. You look it up. You'll see how funny it is. Anyway, he talked about being basically afraid of this idea that, you know, if your wife earns more than you, you're basically done. And he, he would point to this, like, look at this, this guy is done, done, done. And it's like, no, this is very simple red pilled stuff. We actually talk about it in the praxeology of the dominant male and old Ian Ironwood essay on the subject. The problem here is when you base your roles on economic input, that only matters if the man's the primary breadwinner and the girl's the stay at home mom in red pill has always been about adapting. So in this case, you have a primary breadwinning wife and you have a stay at home husband. So if you use economic factors as your, as your input for dominance in the house, of course, you're going to end up in these situations. The thing is though, you have to remove that as the factor. When she walks in the door, the only factor that matters is wife, the husband. I mean, most people will just look at this and go, oh, he's just soy. Never be a stay at home dad. Never do this. A bunch of platitudes and easy talking points because, you know, it feels more macho. If he works in a leather factory all day pushing iron and you're like, it's not helpful, man. As much as we'd love to have everybody gets the ideal life, it doesn't work out that way. You mean to tell me you do your alpha male shit all day, you come home and all of a sudden you find a girl and you marry her and have some kids and then she finds out, hey, I'm making 300000 a year. Well, here's my dick. Good luck, sir. No, no. You can still be a man. It's not hard. Just stop thinking that you were, you just have to think you're more than a paycheck. Treat this stuff as a full time job. To be honest, stay at home dad doesn't sound too bad. Take care of the kids, make some food, clean up the place. I was in the military. Cleaning was like a secondary profession. And then you got tons of time to work out. Think of all those stay at home moms that are flipping through their iPhone or iPad all day looking at nothing. Imagine if that was gym time. You mean to tell me you can't maintain? how healthy sex life with that much spare time it's like come on dude but enough about my rants about it let's get into let's get into the meat of this so jack chimes in again who doesn't like uh jack tenahart stuff so he's like go figure uh i was just starting to think about red pilled women theory on the same week we're banned from their sub oh well that loss uh side note yeah we got into a bunch of fights with the chicks because well there's two reasons one the chicks there took the attitude of well, just because I defer to my husband doesn't mean I'm going to defer to you guys because you're red pilled. And the other one was these guys is like, just because you decided not to nag your husband doesn't mean you get to nag us. And it just goes downhill from there. Red pilled men and red pilled women do not mix. It's like oil and vinegar, cats and dogs. Strategies are completely different. The ideas are completely different. And in fairness, of the red pilled women, the moderators I knew over then, they were soccer moms they're like dude they're horrible people and they can't stand me and i couldn't stand them so i just generally stayed away but every now and then the drama would start and it would be pretty funny anyways they're lost so in any event i am beginning to conclude that the female version of dread is basically an overt ultimatum think about it we know women communicate covertly so we advise against overt dread hence the 12 levels of dread and not just saying fuck me or fuck you but men communicate overtly Pickup, PUA, caught on with guys because it was concrete, actionable, overt advice. Not the usual bullshit like, I'll oh, just go talk to her, bro, or be yourself, or you need to have more confidence. Things like nagging scripts took it to an absurd extreme, but most guys just use that as training wheels anyway. The advice we give on the red pill is similar. Concrete, actionable, overt. Concrete, actionable, overt. Remember those three things when you're watching your next red pilled content creator, by the way, and you'll see that they don't have any of it. Uh, red pilled women seem to advise against, look, you need to shape up or this is over. But with men, the kind of covert action they suggest, be more feminine, nag less, let him lead, can only go so far. Almost all of us probably had some turning point in our life where someone, a father, a teacher, a coach, whatever, told us some version of, you're acting like a loser. And if you don't stop fucking around, you're going to be a loser forever. Or perhaps something like, as long as you're in this state, you're never going to achieve this goal. I cannot make it much more plain than that. So in other words, for a lot of men, the most significant moments that led them to significantly changing and improving their lives usually involved some sort of overt communication. 
I call it personally, the two by four of justice. Just got to put it upside our head. We don't listen too well. We're not the brightest. We're not stupid. But every now and then you just have to like slap us up the side of the head with it because our egos just refuse to let us see it. So back to this. Here's the thing. If you're a woman who wants a happier marriage, red pilled women advice is great for that. Their advice seems to be, look, your husband makes, you know, quarter of a mil a year, manages 12 people. He's clearly capable of being a leader and also a kinder husband. So let him lead, act kind, and trust he'll act kind in response and see what happens. He will probably be more constructive than your current approach of verbally assaulting him every time he brings home the wrong type of ground beef. That, if you don't get that reference, we'll talk about it later, but it's absolutely hilarious. But Leah just doesn't want a happier marriage with the husband. She wants her husband to change, which is a different story. She mentioned letting him manage the bills, and he fucked it up. The red-pilled women advice is irrelevant because the man's not capable of leading. Perhaps he doesn't care. Perhaps he has confidence issues. Maybe a mental disorder. But he won't change until he gets over himself and decides to change. And for a man, that kind of behavior requires overt communication as the catalyst. So my recommendation to women in these situations is basically some form of ultimatum backed by actual consequences for the outcome. Classic example is something like, I'm going to my sister's. I will be back in a week. If you want to save this marriage, then you need to give me a plan on how you're going to fix your shit and then do it. I mean, this is kind of a bitch move, but it's also exactly the kind of message that the op will receive loud and clear. There are two caveats to this. One, as expected, is the husband may respond poorly and resentfully as we're naturally inclined to do when we receive ultimatums. When my wrestling coach told me I was destined to be a loser if I didn't shape up, my first instinct was to tell him to fuck off. And then I went home and I thought about what he said for hours and days to the point that I'm still remembering that exact conversation even today. Even if I decided he was wrong, the message was loud and clear and stronger than any form of communication he could have used. Other caveat is this. My coach did not want me to be a loser. He wanted me to change. He was more than willing to accept the change if I committed to it. He didn't question the change. He wasn't bothered by the fact he had to tell me to change. And I didn't conclude that for myself. He didn't say, yeah, you've changed, but I had to tell you to do that so it doesn't count. Unfortunately, women are not nearly as charitable. They want their man to just get it. As Rolo never hesitates to mention. <laughs> Subtle, but I like it. <laughs> So Op has to ask herself, if she issues this ultimatum and her husband gets his shit together, will she still hold that against him? He didn't just get it, she had to tell him just to get it. The best case scenario is Op's husband gets it without her having to tell him how just to get it, and at least feel good about that. But, if Op is fine with that, and she very well may be, as she's already red pill aware, and she's willing to just ask her husband, potentially reacting poorly, hopefully at first, but you never know, then I think a fix your shit or I'm out is the best form of dread because it's the most direct and overt message that a man needs to get his ass in gear because it's a good fucking thing. Now a woman working through the levels of dread will just produce the opposite effect. The covert messages will be missed or misinterpreted. The husband will probably withdraw further until he finally gets the divorce papers, which he'll say he never saw coming and will totally mean it. And he'll say, if you had all these problems with me in our marriage, why didn't you just say something? So yeah, say something, be overt, be direct, and make it as clear as you need to that his behavior is going to have certain consequences. He may not respond well to that message, but he will get the message. So the one thing on there that I want to add to this is my own little thing. I like how he put it. The ultimatum. There's a trick to it. You can't just say, she may not even know. I need you to do this. I need you to change this. She may not know that. But the way he worded it was, this is the outcome I am looking for. Going off to my sisters. You need to have a better sex life. You need to have this shit together. You know, house needs to be clean, taken care of. I can't come home and fix this stuff. You solve that however you want to. And it puts the onus on him to solve it. So, you know, men are natural problem solvers. So in this case, gets angry about it, gets pissed off, but he takes it and he feeds off that energy. Eventually... Decides, yeah, she's got a point. Fuck it, bitch. Starts working on these things. But it's not up to her to tell him how to do it. Just that it needs to get done. And then it's up to him. If he's invested in the thing, he'll do the stuff. If he's not invested, he won't do it. And he gives, and here's the good point too, is that 
This is kind of uncharted territory. This is really the only example we have, and it worked. But women like a man who just gets it. We all know that, and that's the problem. And this is why relationships, even though they're a woman's job, they can't fix them. It's it's a weird contrast, and sometimes it makes no sense. It just you have to keep these opposite thoughts in your head. If she fixes it, she does this ultimatum, nine times out of ten, the girl will then resent the guy for having to do it. Is this actually him changing, or is this him just trying to please me? And that neuroticism that girls have will fuck it up 100%. This is another reason why the red-pilled women, the red-pilled wives, the purple-pilled debate chicks, they never seem to get anywhere. They just spin around in circles. And, you know, there's certain uh, feminine content creators here doing their own version of, like, a red-pilled woman. One of them, a girl named Ali, you know, Femme Sapien. You might recognize her. We've done some podcasts before. I wish them luck, but I, I also know it's like it's an uphill climb. Anyways, this was not so much applicable to you guys, but it's just neat to see the red-pilled concept flipped on its head with more feminine names. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Cheers. All right. Yeah, this one actually did work out. Uh, Thoughtfully Savage. Thank you, sir, for the super chat. Love you, brother. Uh, Female. Not typical. Move you into the queue. The bit bucket. What's with the questionable monkey tattoo? This isn't a monkey tattoo. Dude, this is a, uh, this is a paisley half sleeve. A monkey tattoo. That was my tattoo for circumnavigating the globe with the military. Unlike most people, I don't just get them because I think it'd be cool that week. So yeah, I think, uh, is Ali, you're in the chat, aren't you? If so, there's something for you. Something be interesting for you. And I see, again, it's the typical problem you're going to have where you teach girls to be more subtle and covert and more attractive and let the man lead and play, you know, submissive so they can be dominant. For a lot of guys, you kind of have to go overt and ultimatum, and then you're going to get to that same problem where once you have to tell him and he doesn't just get it, they tend to not like the gift at that point. So good luck to you. It's a real tattoo showing he's a real alpha giving. Oh, that's where I got it to be. Okay. Here's the quick story about the tattoo we're going to the trip and they're like, all right, we're getting a tattoo and we pulled into Thailand. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to get AIDS in Thailand. So I'll get one here before we go. And I've been thinking about for years what I wanted to the tattoo. And I couldn't think of one. I couldn't think of one. Eventually I walked in, I had some billabong or skateboard shirt with me. And I'm like, you know what? I kind of like that, that beat up Paisley pattern. Just give me one of those. It was literally like a last minute decision. But the reason it, it struck me is because I'm like, it's a French Paisley. Most guys at the time were getting like barbed wire tribals or, you know, other like super macho tattoos. Those fire. I want to get fire down the side. And I'm like, man, I hate that alpha male bullshit. I want you to give me something feminine. And basically all this is missing is like roses. And it'd be like the standard Spanish tattoo. And I'm like, I like that. Because it, uh, it has a confidence to it. It's like a guy who wears a pink shirt to the bar. You going to make fun of him? I'm not confidence about it so i liked it nobody else has it that's the other big thing nobody has this tattoo nobody puts a paisley half sleeve on their arm plus it gives me a chance to talk about her so i liked all of it and then this is every time i look down because i forget it's there i just remember oh yeah that's right you sailed around the earth <laughs> that's pretty cool like everything it's all about your war trophies right all right uh barton sisters i don't know man we're gonna put you in timeout because you're kind of weird. I'd ask you, I'd ask you kindly to stop shitting up the threads here. We'll give it, we'll give it, we'll give it a shot here and see what happens. Yeah, you can lead a horse to water, but sometimes the horse is stupid. You know the funny thing too, though, when reading that, a guy will see a very clear example of when it's time to like, ah, fuck it, it's not worth it, because it's very easy to see when the guy's a lost cause. Like, you can't pay bills, keep a house clean, can't earn money. Like, what can he do other than knock her up twice? But a lot of chicks, man, they have a hard time. They have a hard time doing that themselves. All right. Wrench Baron. Which, which Baron? Oh. Uh. What kind of ship did you serve on? I served on a Canadian frigate. The city class ships. They're all named after cities. So there's like Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, uh, Winnipeg, Regina. I know there's more. Oh, Toronto, Ville de Quebec, 
St. John's. I don't know how many I named there. <laughs> like you guys are focused on the pink shirts now. There's so anyways, there's a little Batman origin story for the tattoo on that one. I only have the one though. I'll probably get some more. Sounds like an amazing low cost liquor. Oh, it's a very low cost liquor. <laughs> Anywho, let's get through the last ones that he's here. So the next one is about oh, sex with the with the with the sick wife. It's ones. This is me. The trip uh, quadruple zero seven again. Sweet time for Mar RSD Rhinestone Daily. Oh, thank you, sir. You lost me at the beginning. So let's get this one going. Where do I want to start with it? I wish it would default to the old Reddit because the new Reddit is so ridiculous. I just can't follow anything on it. I don't know how they decided to make the site less usable, but I mean, whatever. Apparently they banned the word groomer in there because they think it's transphobic, which I'm like, it's a little on the nose, sir. There we go. Dude, I got to remember when I release these ones to put this one out first and the other one out the week after because it'll be a nice little like continuation thing. Anyways, I'm going to get started here. Part one of the two-part series about the 800-pound monster, the most responsible teenager in the room, the absolute... <laughs> I can't say that word, but you know where I'm going with this one. Welcome, Mids Watches. Ryan, this one is neat because this guy's had multiple field reports that have made it to the Mids Watches. This is, I think, the second one. I never really mentioned the first one because it's kind of off topic, but this is part of a two-part series. If you watch this live, I already did the second part where his wife basically berated his fatherhood in front of the kids. And this is the previous one to that. So when you're, when you're, if you're watching this after the fact, I'm making an effort to release this one next and make it a two-part series. So you'll see this part first and then the second part with that part. So it's interesting. Anyways, typical guy. This is me, triple zero seven. Career beta, married an 800 pound hamster. Two Fridays ago, my wife was OTR, but scheduled a date night to reward her for a couple nights of sex. When the date night came, I planned to watch a TV show with her. I know she liked and play some darts in the basement, an activity we used to enjoy before we had kids. She comes down at the right time, and when I get her settled to watch the TV, she leans in and starts to complain. I already know who wins. She hadn't even seen the show. She just read about the ending. So I agree and amplify, redirect the complaints. They keep coming. She's like, if I have to watch something, I'd rather it be something else. But she doesn't name anything else. To which I reply, that's cool. I'm not trying to force you to watch something. We can try again another night. And I proceeded to leave the house and run some errands. She, of course, loses her mind and initiates a three-week-long effort to be mad at him. I never step into her frame. I ignore it when I can, agree and amplify and amuse mastery everything I can. About four days into it, I decide I'm going to make an attempt to end things, but it doesn't work. Finally, seven days into this, I decide I'm going to try nonstop to end it. And I start teasing, touching, acting like absolutely nothing is wrong, etc. After doing this Friday, I can see Saturday I'm beginning to crack her. Finally, Sunday comes around, major shit tests thrown my way, and I fog and negatively assert for two hours straight. I never once step out of my frame, and she is now lovey-dovey and thinks sexy times are imminent when my kids, who have been complaining of a sore throat and 104 fevers, get sores in their throats, and she gets the same thing but no fever. I'm up till 2 a.m. dealing with the puking kids and alternating Advil with Tylenol. I continue to make sexual advances since she wasn't acting very sick, including a hard push last night, but was denied. I acted like it was no big deal and rolled over and went to sleep. Tomorrow, she's going to begin her ovulation phase. If she's really sick, I feel like I'd be being a dick, not an alpha, to continue to push for sex. Do you agree? Do you not agree? Do I withdraw my availability due to being denied? Or do I give this a pass and act like nothing happened due to the illness? I'm inclined to give it a pass. However, I still feel so messed up from being plugged in my whole life that I can't tell the difference between being reasonable versus beta versus alpha versus being a dick. I've lost 19 pounds in five weeks, but I'm still overweight. And part of me wonders if her sore throat, which may be real... Is just a headache since she's not yet physically excited by me. Other than the above and this huge fucking hamster, I feel great that I stayed in my reality and didn't enter hers, which essentially has been 10 days of harpy shrew madness. Thank you, guys. This guy's report is fucking horrible. Horrible. Multiple reasons. One, he is absolutely in his wife's frame. His wife's frame decided that, you know, whenever something happened, it's his fault. She comes complaining. She does all this shit. She decided for, like... A week-long period, 10 days, try to go for three, be just mad and miserable all the time. And he's talking about how he's holding frame, but the entire time, she set the tone and the reality for the relationship. I'm in a bad mood, 
and you need to take responsibility for these emotion emotions and you just make me feel better like you cannot be in your frame when you're agree and amplifying and fogging for two straight hours and then the worst part is it's a covert contract if i do these red pill tips and tricks then my wife's emotions will change and we'll have a problem free life and everything will be happy and it just does not work that way but he unfortunately does not get it there's a pretty big separation between this and the second field report though so it's nice to see that at this point it starts where he's so far gone he has no idea what he's doing and then later on he gets an idea what he's doing and then finds out okay so she's still a cunt and this is this is a big lesson for you guys before we get into the meat of this specific field report for a lot of guys your wife may be a bitch. She may be horrible. She may be all those things that you're venting and ranting about over a beer, over a subreddit, over a post, over a tweet, a video, whatever. Here's the thing, though. If you don't have your shit together, if you don't have frame, if you don't have your mental models right, if you don't have strong boundaries, you don't get to know that yet. You have to build yourself up to the man that you need to be. Make yourself red-pilled. Sort this shit out. Get strong boundaries. Have a frame. Then, when you're there... You're able to actually assess, am I just a pussy or is she just a cunt? One of you guys is a vagina reference and we're going to, the only way to find out is to fix you first. This is something else to keep in mind. And yeah, this sucks for guys. You're like, why do I have to work this hard for a chick who's acting like this? It's like you do because right now you have the best sparring partner ever. You've seen a girl who's conditioned to see and assume you at your worst. She knows all of your tricks. She knows all of your tips. She's seen you at the most unattractive in your life. She will not fall for anything you do. If you have anything doing any bullshit, she will call the bluff 100% of the time. The best sparring partner you can find. I'm not saying you're winning her back. I'm not saying you're even going to want to win her back. But the harder opponent you will never find. Because if you just ditch her and get a different girl, she doesn't know any of this bullshit. And you're going to fall into the exact same trap. And I've seen it happen before. So remember the sparring partner. If you remember nothing else from this, remember the concept of the sparring partner. Sometimes by fixing your marriage, you have to kill it. But in order to do that, you got to work on it first. Does that make sense? I hope so. So Jack chimes in. Uh, it may just be how you phrased it, but you're not. But it sounds like you're not trying to condition your wife so directly. It's supposed to go, give me sex and affection during the week, and you'll get dinners and movie nights on the weekend. That's not a good way to put it. It's like sex should be constant because it should be something that's mutually desired. You mentioned both of you loved, used to love playing darts. Well, if she suggests a game of darts to you and you both have fun, wouldn't you think that should factor into any sort of score? You engaged in a mutually enjoyable activity. Nobody did anything out of obligation or consideration. You should think of sex in the same way. Now, it's possible your increased frequency of sex is reflecting an overall more pleasant, positive attitude on her part. And that attitude makes you more inclined to do things, which, you know, watch movies, play darts, whatever. If so, great. Just avoid the conditional thinking around sex. If she's a bitch, but she's putting out, you shouldn't want to play darts with her because why do you want to play darts with a bitch? Likewise, if she's acting kind and affectionate, but isn't putting out, you don't need to think, well, it'd be fun to throw some darts with her, but I don't know if she's putting out in order for me to play darts. If you'd think you'd have fun with your wife playing darts, just fucking play some darts. And he kind of points out to what I caught where he's like, you know, that's cool. I'm not trying to force you to watch something. We can try again another night. And he leaves and he goes, this is coming across as a covert contract. You plan some activities that you thought she'd appreciate. Instead, she's shitting all over your plans and not even suggesting her own. You probably imagine suggesting darts and then she say, oh, wow, we haven't played it forever. I'm sure I'm terrible. And that you'd like, oh, who cares? It'll be fun. And then you enjoy yourselves for an hour or two and you both suck, but you're laughing and she's laughing and the doves come in and all this shit. So it's memories of fond past like look no oh yeah and he kind of goes in this story he takes a long ways but he ends up like let me give you a blowjob out of appreciation while i'm at it <laughs> i just laughed and he goes yeah so that didn't happen she just kind of shat all over your plans and you got pretty frustrated because well goddamn wife can't even chill the fuck out for five minutes to actually enjoy herself and if she's not gonna do that why the fuck bother and i get it it's understandable but in the future you may want to try one reset something like look here's what's gonna happen it's been a long week I'm going to go upstairs, and I'm going to pour myself a glass of wine and grab you one too. I'm going to bring both those glasses down, and we're going to start enjoying the weekend. If you'd care to join me, that second glass of wine is yours. Think about it. I'll be back. Go upstairs, get the wine, come back down. Act like everything's cool. 
that all you really care about are the kids in bed and you're looking forward to relaxing for a few hours with or without her. Talk to her about the wine or any other random shit. I think you'll find she's still closed off at first, but eventually she'll chill the fuck out and drop the attitude. If she's still got the attitude, then she's clearly concluded she's determined to act like a miserable bitch tonight, and you'd be better off choosing to get out of your house and not deal with her negativity. But, one reset. Look, my wife does this often, especially on Fridays. It's like she can't just disconnect from the week and she's still hamstering about her job or our kids or some other bullshit. And she sees me kicking back and she's resentful that I'm able to do it so easily. And when this happens, I give her one, exactly one, chance to tell that hamster to take the night off and enjoy your Friday. Usually it works. And even if it doesn't, it avoids a situation like this where she's taken a week-long effort to shit all over. That's not her taking the night off. Instead... That's her spinning her wheels in her 800-pound hamster of glory, thinking that you're a dick who ditched her because she had the audacity to suggest watching another TV show. Was she being an annoyingly negative bitch? Yes. Withdrawing your affection? Right move. But it's better if you can do it in a way that maintains your frame. You just want to spend an enjoyable evening with your wife, without your wife, and you have no fucking idea why she's resistant to that. But that's not your problem. You want to make it very clear with your actions with your actions emphasis mine with your actions that she's acting resistant to enjoying a good time and that's why you're choosing to spend your time alone rather than with her when you abruptly launch yourself out of the house because she's being an unappreciative bitch or complaining about your movies and darts that's not being clear in general you're grasping red pill fairly well but then you have these moments of abrupt behavior that leads to completely unnecessary confrontation so then you have to go and do things like this. And he's talking about the, the four hours of agree and amplify and that crap. He goes, I think you feel justified in feeling frustrated or annoyed with your wife's unpleasant behavior. But it seems you let it shake your frame, shake your stoicism, and lead you to confronting the 800-pound hamster head on. Literally, almost every one of your field reports is basically, my wife's a bitch, so I reacted abruptly in this fashion because I was tired of her shit, and then she became an even bigger bitch. But I held it together, and then we fucked after a week. It's like, dude, see the pattern here? When you get annoyed at her hamster, you don't need to confront it. You don't need to say the equivalent of that goddamn spinning is pissing me off and I'm not going to put up with that shit. As you've now observed repeatedly, that just encourages it to double down. And now you have to wait a whole goddamn week for it to settle itself out. Now that's far superior to submitting to the hamster, but it just doesn't need to be this hard. Like when confronted with a generally negative attitude from your wife, you pretty much want to communicate, look, all that spinning seems like a lot of work for no reason. You might enjoy yourself a little more if you just calm the fuck down, just saying. And of course, now that I've picked, you know, 10,000 characters as a response, I'm going to go ahead and answer your actual question. It's always been very verbose like this. So his question was like, do I withdraw my availability? Is it because of the sickness? What do I do? He's like, all right, if your inclination is that she's not actually sick, in the medical sense of the term, you could be right. It's possible she's not actually sick, she's just... Feeling sick as it's psychosomatic. A lot of girls do this as like a buffer to keep from having sex with their husbands. You know, the I have a headache thing. So hang around with your kids when they're snotting all over the place or whining about sore throats and you'll start to feel a sore throat or just assume you're coated in germs that are literally invading all your body. So I suppose my conclusion is I think you're right that she wasn't actually sick, but she probably did feel gross and diseased in general along with good reason. You can see why she ruled out sexy times. And then his uh, second part with, I've lost a bunch of weight. Maybe she just doesn't find me attractive yet. He's like, here's where I think this is going to make a difference. She turns you down. You say, okay, okay, cool. No problem. You feel pretty gross yourself, and you're going to go take a shower. You undress, go to the bathroom. If you're looking fit and thin, she may suggest that she follows you. If not, then enjoy your shower. She's in bed. She's reading. And that gross, diseased crap feeds into the background. And then she sees you walk out of the shower. You tell yourself off. You change. Maybe a few tingles. Quickly overcome whatever diseased feeling she has you get back in bed you notice she's still being frisky despite turning down sex oh, it looks like you're getting laid tonight after all there's actually some more merit to this than it gives it credit for in this comment a lot of times guys may mistake what's called a hard no from a soft no and a hard no is just no like no means no kind of no but a soft no is more like token resistance which is like oh, it's weird it's a wife why is there to chicks are weird Sometimes they like turning it down just so you try a little harder. It makes them feel wanted. I don't know. I think it's like the feminine equivalent of like <laughs> of the of the stereotypical 
Chad, who just grabs his wife's head and throws it into his lap and expects her to figure it out from there, to be honest with you. Because it's, it's, it's just, it's just as off-putting on the other side of things. It's the best, it's the best analogy I can give you. I don't even know. Uh, so the guy's, you know, running a victory lap over his, staying in his frame, which he absolutely wasn't, but he thinks he is. I mean, so, it's like, like, you should feel happy. You're not in frame, but you're feeling better about it, and that's great. You're doing a lot more right than you're doing wrong so far. At least as far as what you've described here. Your wife's hamster is so goddamn insistent on having you submit to a frame and fall all over yourself, apologizing and taking blame for non-existent faults, and you've continually resisted. So in that regard, great. But if there's a long-term takeaway advice, or a piece to this advice, it's this. We talk about red pill marriage being hard mode, and you and your wife's specific circumstances and deterioration of your marriage before you swallowed the red pill already, have you playing it on extra hard mode? But reacting abruptly, as hopefully you understand by now, just triggers nightmare mode, and now you have to deal with shit like a week-long shit test or grossly manipulative emotional emails or whatever the fuck. And nothing's wrong with playing on nightmare mode per se, except for it takes longer, and it's more annoying, and there's not really any extra reward. The only silver lining is extra hard mode should now seem a lot easier by comparison. So stick to that difficulty because there's no reason to fight all 800 pounds of this emotional hamster, not every time you encounter it. It doesn't drop any extra weapons, you don't get bonus points, it's just going to chew up your health and armor and make you waste a bunch of ammo. So see if there's a way you can just bypass it entirely, even better. Think about whether you can just type in, I don't give a shit, and be on your way. We'll be waiting. Uh, some final thoughts before we finish this off. You've probably, if you've been a uh, member of the channel for a while, you've probably heard me talk about how things get worse before they get better. And psychologically, there's a reason for it. People latch on to identities. In this case, the wife pictures the husband a certain way. She has her certain ways of dealing with these things. These things kind of build up organically over years. So when he starts actually learning how to develop a frame, he starts making himself attractive. He starts learning these tools to, to handle these situations without escalating him into anger, making unnecessary conflict turning it more towards a sexual role, more pleasant, that kind of stuff. The wife responds worse at first. And this is where Jack, I think, gets it wrong because he keeps talking about it's because Op was doing things wrong. And you're going to find this out later on. It's like, no, she really is a bitch. He needs to focus more on his own frame because her frame can escalate. But until he has his own frame, he's not making it any better. But even when you're doing everything right, which he wasn't yet, but when he does, she will act worse at first because she's used to a certain way these things go. It's like you were saying before, every field report. Something innocuous happens. She freaks out. I try to apologize to the hamster. She has a week-long temper tantrum, and then we fuck on that weekend. When you deviate from that script, she thinks something is wrong in her, like, limbic brain, and so she acts worse, acts worse, acts worse. Nightmare mode, insane mode, god-tier mode, plaid mode, if it's Spaceballs reference for you there. And as a guy, you're thinking, well, dude, this isn't working. This is making things worse. But in the end, you realize it's no. Things have to get worse before they get better. Because she is outside of her comfort zone right now. And the way that people react to being outside their comfort zone is to double down on the things that they used to do before. The beauty of this is, though, if this man learns to build his own frame, if this man learns to handle this stuff properly, in this case, you know, a more sophisticated way of like leaving without like sending a clear message of boundary enforcement through your actions, pulling your attention, commitment, and affection. He does that. It starts to work better. And as it starts to work better, she starts to slowly respond. It's, it's a concept called the thousand foot tow rope. The idea that it takes time for the other person to change their models to match your additional frame. But even if it doesn't, if you can handle this harpy bitch of a wife in this extent for this long, the next girl is going to be a fucking breeze. So either way, no matter what happens, the stay plan is the same as the go plan. And you're going to find out from the next episode how this plays out. Does he keep her? Does she calm down? Does he lose her? And she's just like this? Whatever girl's next in the line, she'll be like, wow, this guy's so stubborn, but he's so sexy. Anyways, enjoy it. I'll catch you guys in the next one, man. Uh, let's do some more saves. What did I call this one?
Oh, right. Sick wife. There we are. Into the bit bucket. How are you guys doing in chat? Keeping up? One, two, three, four. The fifth one. Dang. Getting through all five today. Then I have a shit ton of editing to do on Tuesday. Who doesn't like to do that? All right. Uh, can't be worse than a handle of peach. What the hell is peach taka? Adulting is dealing with paradox. I think that's a good way of putting it, actually. Like, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to steal that for a tweet. Adulting is dealing with, I don't put quotes around adulting because Nick hates it. One of the pink, one of the stink, but neither of them is pink and they both stink. Jesus Christ, dude. Where the hell did you come up with this stuff? Uh, would have filed divorce on the third day or at least moved my cabin in the woods, regardless of my body weight. Ryan's advice is better, though. Here's the thing. It's it's so easy to say it when you're looking at these from the outside. Fuck that bitch. I'm out of here. Two problems with that. One, you got to remember, this is like the the learned helplessness, male learned helplessness. At first, things are going well. Maybe things start to get worse. As they get worse, there's no escape. She's just pregnant with a brand new baby. I can't divorce her. Maybe it's because she's pregnant. They make up excuses and they don't escape. They don't escape and they don't escape. Eventually, when escape does become an option, which has always been there, but once you realize I could actually leave her, the guy still doesn't leave because he's so used to this, this state of helplessness. It's self-inflicted, but it's still there. That it becomes a habit. It's called learned helplessness. <laughs> Secondly, it doesn't fix the underlying problem. Like, the problem isn't my wife's a bitch. In this case, she was. His problem is he lets her treat him like shit. He doesn't have frame. He doesn't have a worldview. He doesn't have ability to handle boundary enforcement, conflicts, shit like that. It's not because he didn't set up date night, right? Nobody gives a shit about that. And here's the thing. I've seen it before. There's I am Steve McQueen. I talk about him every now and again. But he was this guy in a previous situation, and he just ditched. He's like, you know what? Fuck it. I don't need this shit. I got it. Thanks, guys. And we're like, I don't know, man. You might want your sparring partner. And he did. Six weeks later, gets with a new girl. He's like, oh, I got a new great. This one's better than this one in any any way, shape, and form. And I'm like, that's wonderful. And then a month or two in, he's like, guys, she's starting to act a lot like my bitch ex-wife. And it turns out it was just because he didn't fix his underlying behaviors. The next girl's just going to act the same. They literally followed the lead. He set the frame as in, <laughs> you can act as shitty as you want because I will let you. And girls, for some reason, you can't tell them what to do. But if you act like shit... They'll be more than happy to do exactly what you want and it's to treat you like shit. Thank goodness no Hawaiian shirts today. Oh, shush you or I'll put my Hawaiian shirt on as we speak. Uh, Tom Canuck, $5 one cent. No, thank you, sir, for saving it. Pretty sure I take more away from one episode of Mids Watches than I have in like six months of other channels. So thanks. Well, you know the difference, right? The difference is these are th real situations and people. It's stuff that actually happened. It's not some abstract value system preached into the fucking microphone. That's why I hate that shit. Rolo, Rolo gets a pass because Rolo's kind of the one that started the 10,000 foot view of this stuff. And he's generally taken Pickup and Evo Psych and meshed it together and draw the connections to where they were there. So he gets a pass. But everybody else is just saying that and like, oh, let's uh, mentally masturbate over Rolo's work and call it my own. And I can't stand that shit. That's why... That's why I'm so ornery and jaded and cynical on fucking Twitter. <laughs> yeah, scrap the fairy tale. Got to be a duck when she's a punt. Arousal depends on our being able to stand strong when she falls apart. And that's the thing. See, that's like, and I don't, I know what you're trying to say, but even that kind of words it as a covert contract where if I act strong, she'll fucking calm down. No, you're going to act strong because that's how you become more attractive to anybody. Do you remember the old report where I had it's a, uh, your goal isn't to fuck your wife, but it's to be more fuckable. Same thing here. Your goal to have frame isn't because your wife will appreciate you with more frame. It's because you need a fucking frame and that's how you'll be more fuckable. And when you're more fuckable, that means everything. That means you negotiate better at work. The halo effect with friends, the wife becomes more submissive. The side piece likes you that much. All that shit. It's just got like, it's, it's a nonstop set of payoffs, but you can't really guarantee any of them. But it's just, it pushes you in the right direction. Uh, it sounds similar to the JoJo effect, like the anime. When you go too far, too fast from your comfort zone, the recoil is harder. Yeah, it's pretty similar. 
Anyways, uh, just give me one second here. I'll be right back. I'll start the last episode with you guys. Do I have... Oh, good, I do got it. All right, all right, all right. Let's hit it up, last episode, then we'll chuck a little shit at each other and then call it a day. So when a chick has daddy issues, it's supposed to be for her dad, not your dad. <laughs> Welcome, Midswatch, Ryan. Hopefully you guys are catching this one. I don't know when it's coming out. When it's coming out, enjoy yourself. This one's simple. Guy just has a question. She's disrespecting and dislikes my dad. Uh, the Matrix wants me back is the guy's username. It's pretty funny. Anyway, so I'm new to the red pill. What do I do when my wife disrespects and try to keep distance from me and my dad? I haven't had a chance to try any new approach yet. I just want to be ready when it happens again. Side note, keep in mind, I'm just starting. I was drowning blue pill before that. So I've been listening to some of No More Mr. Nice Guy as an audiobook and lurking a bit. I'm on a trip, so it's tough to do much more right now. And when we're with my dad, she acts pouty, rolls her eyes. She doesn't laugh at his jokes. You know, sometimes they're not funny. My dad is blue-pilled, but he's still my dad. Once I had him over prior to finding out Red Pill, while she was on a long trip away from the house, the wife flipped her lid and we had a big fight because I didn't tell her first. Read, ask her permission. I gave in saying I would tell her at some point when somebody visits our house. We spend exponentially more time with her family than with mine. Back when I focused on being fair, I tried to point this out. And she actively tries to discourage us from hanging out and gets moody when she knows I'm going to spend time with him. It says shit like, oh, good for you. Have fun, I guess. Or I bet you guys are going to have a great time, huh? And it's just dripping with sarcasm and she swears she's not doing it. So here's the questions I would like advice on. What to do when she indirectly disrespects him when we hang out, which is rare. Do I try to play, you know, don't give a fuck? And concerning with people visiting the house, do I man up? You know, hey, this is my house. I pay the bills. Even though I said XYZ before, I'll have whoever I want over when I want, which feels like a double standard. So far, I get that I need to stop complaining and bitching and stop arguing with her. My dad's not a bad guy, and she has a hard time giving concrete reasons why she doesn't like him. But it's been a problem since we've been together. Thank you. A uh, couple things before we get started. One, this is surprisingly common, and this kind of shit would not fly today. Guys coming in hat in hand. Hey, guys. I, I, one guy actually bragged about, I purchased when I say, no, I feel guilty five minutes ago. Now help me out with my problem. Everybody's like, fuck you, read. And there's a reason. This is all an issue. This is an issue of frame and boundaries. It's a very simple one. In fact, most of these issues you're noticing are frame and boundaries. And had he actually gone through the whole sidebar, had he checked, and I got the sidebar playlist here. When I say, no, I feel guilty. Learn some assertiveness. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Shed your nice guy behaviors. Get rid of that beta crap. Uh, married man sex life primer. Learn the difference between alpha and beta behaviors and how they apply. Practical female psychology. Learn how these things are going and where he is in her roadmap to, uh, what do they call that? The beta, the beta hood, something or other. Anyways, it's basically the five cycle, five steps of a cycle of relationships. And he's in the one where nothing you can do is right, which is nearing the end. But he comes in hat in hand. Hey guys, what do I do? How do I do this? I'm actually surprised he didn't delete his account. Most people who do this, they ask the one question, they fish for an answer that they want to hear, and then they uh, go on their way. But this guy, well, he stuck around, kept his account going. Funny enough, he actually had a few more posts. And it was mostly about doubt and uncertainty. But again, until you finish the sidebar, it's always going to be like that. So, following up, Jack Ten of Hearts. Somebody golded his, his thing here, so you know it must have been excellent. So the high school head cheerleader decides to date a cute boy in an honors English class. Sure, he's a little nerdy compared to Chad Thundercock, you know, the jocks he's used to dating, but all of her friends still think, yeah, he's cute, and he's smart, and he's funny, and he has a lot of friends. He fits in easily with their social circle, and she's happy. One day, she swings by his house to hang out, Except he has some friends over, because while English is the only advanced class our head cheerleader is taking, boyfriend is also in honors calculus, honors physics, and his own social circle reflects that. These friends wear weird clothes, their bodies are weird, thin, lumpy, they speak in grating nasally tones, some of them are impossibly quiet and the conversation is just 
hours of enduring long, awkward silences. Others can't shut the fuck up. And they'll use opening and small talk to start complaining about shit like Joss Whedon. These friends are nerds. Our head cheerleader's boyfriend knows there's no way his social circle can mix with hers, and he's fine with that. He knows they'll annoy the shit out of his girlfriend, but he'll just keep those worlds separate. Easy enough, right? Well, apparently not, because the mere idea of her boyfriend associating with these guys bothers our head cheerleader. To her boyfriend, it makes no sense to him. He hangs out with her friends 90% of the time. When he hangs out with those nerd friends, he does it alone, at no inconvenience to her, so what's the problem? Our head cheerleader can't give him a good answer, until eventually she's frustrated enough to say, look, I just don't want to have a boyfriend who hangs out with losers like these fucking guys. And there it is. She thinks they're losers. She doesn't associate with losers, but she's associating with somebody who associates with losers. That association by proximity is unbearable to her. Our head cheerleader's boyfriend is at something of a turning point. Are those friends losers? He doesn't think so, but he's not going to dispute why she would think so. But is this the relationship he wants? All the friends have to come meet some minimum threshold of coolness to her, even if he's willing to minimize any exposure. If he's not hanging out with his girlfriend approved friends, is that unacceptable to her? Now, this little parable was my attempt to answer the question. It's not just that your dad is blue pill. Your girlfriend thinks that your father is worse. She thinks he's a loser, or what the red pill community would call an omega male. <laughs> Don't ask. Just know it's not good. Uh, she thinks you're associating with him reflects poorly on you, and ultimately poorly on her. And even worse, her offspring has one quarter of that guy's genetics. She's going to do everything she can to make sure that he doesn't infect your child with his loserness by socializing with him. So that's my theory. And if you think it has any merit, then my answer is this. What do you do? Do I just try to play like I don't give a fuck? He's like, pretty much, yes. Because this guy's your dad, so really, fuck her and fuck her frame. And her frame is pretty much that anyone she wants to associate with cool is cool, and anybody she doesn't want to associate with is a loser. Now, as you increase your own sexual market value, you know, the lifting, the being attractive, being more unattractive, the whole sidebar describes all of this stuff, don't worry about it, she will change. Most likely. As you develop and follow your male action plan to become the professional, social, physical success story that you want to be, your associations will no longer be questioned. If your dad makes a joke that you think is funny and your wife thinks is corny, then guess what? It's funny. Your reality is now stronger than hers. You have probably seen something like this in a professional context before. You're getting some face time in an organizational meeting with some high-ranking VP. One of your colleagues makes a really terrible, corny joke involving a juvenile pun or something, and you're in the middle of rolling your eyes when you see the VP laugh, like a genuine laugh. And suddenly, everybody else starts laughing too. Even you. And it's not just to mimic the VP. Somehow, just the VP thinking the joke was funny actually made the joke funny. And this is how eventually you get your wife to stop giving you shit about your dad. Until then, just assert your boundaries. You're going to spend time with your own father and fuck her if she has a problem with it. There's three ports in there. I think three parts, I think. If I only say two, bear with. I've talked about it before. I think Rolo and I talked about it. He's, a, for some reason, a San Francisco 49ers fan. And uh, his wife is, too. Like, really? Do you think she was a fan when you got together? I was like, I don't know. Well, she's a fan now. Uncle Vaz said something similar, where if you meet a girl who's got cool hobbies, you're basically meeting the cool hobbies of the dude she used to sleep with before him. Girls are borderline. You guys may think of BPD or borderline personality disorder. That's an extreme version of it. But borderline itself, get rid of the uh, extreme version of it. It's just feminine behavior. And one of the big parts of feminine behavior is they tend to mirror other people. In the same way that I've talked about narcissism as being thinking of yourself as the main character in your one-act play and everybody around you is an archetype, a borderline personality is somebody who thinks of themselves as the leading female actress and the director is guiding her. Basically takes her identity off the other person. Now, in this case, she has some strong frame to her. Probably an American chick, they tend to be headstrong like this because, you know, Disney's for the last 50 years telling them, you go, queen. She gets with a guy, tries to be, you know, nice, pleasant. But in reality, what he's doing is he's just falling into her frame. So as he starts to develop his own frame, and there's any attraction there, which I'm assuming there is, she will start to mirror the things that he likes in the same way that that, you know, 
the VP at the company laughs, so everybody else laughs. But it's not that they were just doing it to placate them. It's just that it actually changes their perception of what funny is. Social mirroring. It turns out it's the thing we've all done for most of our lives. It's, it's really, girl's into you. She starts mirroring your body behavior. If there's a cool guy that you're friends with, he starts doing something. You start doing something too. It's not because you're just trying to mirror, mimic him. It's like a subconscious thing. And so it's funny. In this point, like he would never draw the connection being how he's brand new. But the whole reason she can't stand his dad is because he doesn't have enough alpha behaviors. Sounds really counterintuitive. How can I get her to like my dad? Well, hit the gym. What? That's dumb. No, it's not. Hit the gym. Build some abundance. Flirt around with other girls. Have girls flirt with you even better. Displays of higher value. A little bit of dread. All that stuff that makes you attractive. That one foot out the door. The aloofness. The dark... Tr all that stuff. You get to a point where your girl stops looking at you and starts looking up to you. And that's the case where I love my dad, even though he's a bit of a blue-pilled chump. She starts to take the attitude that, you know what, I like your dad, even though he's a blue-pilled chump. And it's not because she's trying to make you happy that she takes this thing. It's that she actually believes it. There's your, that's the closest you're going to find to hacking human wetware for your own ends. Unfortunately, it's not easy. You have to be the best man you can be, which sucks for him. But hey, it's his dad. I'm assuming it's worth it. So enjoy yourselves, guys. I'm going to catch you on the next one. Cheers. There you go. All right, so that's the five. I think we're good. Uh, what I call this one? Oh yeah, it doesn't like dad. All right, move you into the bit bucket. And now I have to edit 15 videos because why wouldn't I edit all damned day? Dark Knight Dev. Isn't that Kimler to Kaiser Soze who was willing to destroy his family instead of not being in control? I mean, there's there's some creative flair to that, but yeah, it's the similar kind of thing. Look, your goal here is to be happy with your life. Like, sustainably happy. Maximum happiness for those that are inside of your inner circle and to vet the people in your inner circle to create boundaries for them so they know how to stay in that inner circle and to be valued enough that they want to. Command respect, not demand respect. And unfortunately, there's no other way to do it. The my way or the highway, it's the only method that's been proven to work. Because some people will do it for a time because they, they want to manipulate you, but they can't do it forever. And in that case, you just got to be able to shed them aside. But yeah, my way or the highway, you have, to be, you have to be willing to kill it. And if you're not willing to kill it, then the other person wants it less. And typical of your cardinal rule of relationships, they'll always win. Uh, next is Ari, Arigato. Oh. Five euro super chat. No, I will not talk about the cuck article, sir. <laughs> you guys are your five dollars. You're killing me. Uh, what kind of tests when she asked whether she is prettier than other girl or she asked what I would do if she had a stalker or whether she's fat? Oh, those. Those are all comfort tests, dude. Um, depending on who you ask is how you handle it. But uh, generally speaking, when you go those, I prefer cocky funny. Cocky funny is always the go-to. Is she prettier than me? Well, I guess the first question to ask you is, is that girl prettier than her? If so, try this one out. Try being honest. Yeah, of course. But you'll get mad. Well, why does getting, why is your girl getting mad at you bother you so much? Is having her mad that bad? Well, you're not supposed to like her more than me. It's like, I like you more than her, but you never asked me who I like better. You asked who was prettier. Subtlety in there is that you don't, like you you're aware of your wife's feelings but you're not obliged to coddle them i'm not gonna lie to you i've said this before multiple times in my own relationship i may make you cry i will never lie to you now she didn't like that but she got used to it starts to like it now because now she knows when she gives me something i can at least get an honest answer even if she doesn't want to hear it if she doesn't want to hear it she just stops asking and that's why i don't ever get asked do you think that girl's prettier than me because if she is i'll tell her <laughs> same thing what would you do if she had a stalker? These are, again, and I, I, the way I give you these answers, they sound like it's just some cocky shit, and it's like, oh, that's funny, but you have to really, you have to believe it. What would you do if you had a stalker? I don't know. If he, if he manages to win you over, he can have the truck, too. What happened? Do you think I'm fat? Is she fat? Well, just say, you could stand to lose a few. You may have to say, yeah, you're a fat cow, you cunt. Like, that's a little bit mean just for the sake of it, but you can lose a few. 
why would you say that? I'm so self-conscious. It's like, well, let's go to the gym then. Come on. We'll, we'll prep meals together. It'll be fine. I don't know why, but it's like, I need to make a whole video on just like, try being honest with women. <laughs> it's like, just give it a shot. You might like it. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be blunt. But you don't have to lie. Like, why would you lie to her? If she is fat and you don't want her to be fat, why would you tell her, no, no, you look great, honey. Do you think that's how you get her ass to the gym? You think that's how you get her to eat better? No. You could lose a few. Oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, don't worry, babe. You're not that bad yet. I still find you hot. But we could be better. Try it. And you're going to find really quickly when I, everybody's like, oh, alpha male this and alpha male that. I'm like, really? How many of these fucking guys do you think are afraid of fucking girl emotions? I guarantee you 99% of these people, unless they're a fucking sociopath, because it's hardwired into guys to be afraid of their wife's emotions. They to seek her validation. Yeah, it's too funny. Actually communicate truthfully with, pe truthfully with people. That's this it, man. That's it. That was the tomato Sonic stays pissing cabby. What the hell? Oh, the Sonic ice cream one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys in the fucking tomatoes thing. All right. I'm trying that button for adding my own ads. I have no idea if it's going to work or not. I don't know if you guys caught it. You just probably caught one there, but... Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess I can end on this. It was funny. I don't remember who I'm stealing this quote from, but the reason that red pill, the red pill is considered such an angry, misogynist place is because it has the revolutionary idea of treating women like human beings and not some kind of better levitating above the rest of us deity. And I always found that funny. Yeah, it's like, it's kind of the MGTOWs have kind of latched onto it. Women think they're hot shit. It's like, yeah, they do, but... Have you ever tried just being honest? Have you ever tried just, like, not holding back? Have you ever tried being, like, kind enough not to lie to the person? Try it out. Girls lie. Everybody lies to a girl their whole fucking life. When they were kids, their parents lied to them to get them to stop doing things. When they become adults, every guy who wants to fuck them will lie to them, say exactly what she wants to hear. Other girls will lie to her, too. Oh, yeah, cut your hair off. Oh, no, keep eating. It's fine. You still look hot. Oh, yeah, it's health at any size. Everybody lies to a chick. Until she hits, like, whatever wall age it is, like, 30, 35, whatever. And then guys stop lying to her because now I don't want to fuck you. So, like, yeah, I'll treat you like a normal person. Just imagine. Imagine that person. Lived in a fantasy land their entire fucking life. And then one day, everybody starts being honest with them. They're like, did everybody turn into an asshole? It's like, no. You've just had smoke blown up your ass for 30 straight years, and now you're seeing what real people live like. And, yeah, if you ever wondered why spinsters are fucking angry bitches, it's probably why. If I lied to you for your whole life and then stopped lying one day, you'd be pissed too. Now, I don't mean to have empathy, you know, whatever. Being a bitch is not my problem. <coughs> but it just kind of lets you know. Like, we're all fucked together, so. Have you ever seen how a guy that thinks he's hot shit gets treated? Oh, jeez. To be fair, do you guys know that Justin Waller guy? This is a perfect example. He gets treated like a girl. And I don't mean that in the bad way. I mean, he's like, what, he's like six foot three, jacked, rich. Nice jaw. All the all the things are at the top level, right? He's got a completely different worldview from anybody else because he's just never had to adapt to hardcore shit. My stepdad was the same way, and you watch it too because and I, this is where I kind of feel... I don't want to say I feel bad for him because he's never had it, but that archetype of person, I, I do not envy them because when they crash, they end up in a marriage, things go sour... They don't have the tools to deal with it. And so they always default to, to things like anger. And when you default to that shit, it's the most unattractive thing ever. It turns out when we're at our worst, people are willing to step on us. And we actually act as bad as we can that would prevent us from getting the help that we need. So it's like the most weird self-sabotaging thing ever. I mean, if you want to take that as revenge, like, yeah, Chad's going to get his in the end. It's like, take that if you want. But that's not really my point. The point is... Every one of us guys are going to end up in the same spot, whether we are Chad or whether we're Beta Billy or whether we're the average guy or what. It's all the same stuff because people are all generally the same. Anyways, uh, I think we've already done this one off. How long are we on for now? Is this like Rolo Tomasi level rants? Jesus, hour and a half. Yeah, I think that's enough for today. Uh, no way. I'd love to be just born with it. You'd think so. I'll tell you right now. I would hate that. I would hate that. Late Bloomer, I think, was awesome. Because you get to see both sides. It's like, you know who the best people are? Here's a good example. Here's a, here's a, a metaphor that I'll be explaining. Have you ever met those trust fund babies? Dad was rich. His dad was rich. They were rich. They've never been poor. 
They don't know how money works. They don't care how money works. Have you ever watched those guys? Are they, are they fun to deal with? If they became the prime minister of Canada, would they be driving the country in a good direction or a bad direction? Are they, generally speaking, nice, good people, or are they kind of out of tune? Yeah, they may be pleasant to talk to, but they're not good. On the other hand, have you ever met those guys that started off poor, bad family, outcome? They make something of themselves. You ever talk to those people? Those people generally are great. And the best part is they know they know what failure looks like. They tend to be more empathic to those that are poor but trying. They tend to be better able to cross those divides. And I think I think that's great. That's great. I think more people should. I think it's one of the best lessons that a parent could give their kid, and I don't know how to do it, but raise them poor. <laughs> raise them poor. Don't tell them they have money until they turn 18. But eh, do what you do. Anyways, hopefully that helps you understand the concept a bit better. Uh, if this was Rolo, you'd just be now starting the first mids watch. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, my pops offered himself, and I've been homeless before. I am that guy. I'd still rather be born with it. That's too bad. Like, I'm surprised. The way you're saying you'd rather be born with it, you're acting as if, like, none of the things you've learned from those hard times are of any use to you now, and that you don't think they're valuable, or you think that you would still get them if you were raised with a silver spoon. Now, I'm here to tell you flat out you wouldn't be. You absolutely wouldn't be. I don't know. I can give you 100,000 examples of it. <laughs> Rolo long winds are the best. They're great for monetization and shit. I'll give them that. But having said that, these aren't made for monetization. Their thumbnails are just fucking trash <laughs> the titles are trash it's just it's just raw recordings and shooting the shit with each other right anyways i'm gonna let you guys go thank you throw a like if you like the thing thank you for the super chats if i missed any actually i should probably go check before i let you guys go make sure i didn't miss any no we caught them all thoughtfully savage tom canuck dark knight dev or still but i mean at the end of this i just want you to take from it what the actual red pill is what was involved with it kind of stuff that went into it actual work practical shit nothing drives me nuts more than people talking about whamming in the abstract and so i'm doing my best to be the kind of change i want to see does the algorithm like it no does it give you red meat no do i have to do chick talks to compensate yes but whatever enjoy it i'll catch you guys on the next one man cheers <laughs>